so good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Samir Gandesha, and I'm associate professor in uh, the Department of Humanities here at SFU, and I'm also um, the director of the Institute for the Humanities, uh, which is one of the um, co-presenters of uh, our event this evening. Um, I'd uh, like to begin by acknowledging that this event is taking place on the unceded territories um, of the Coast Salish people, uh, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, um, and Squamish nations. Um, it gives me a tremendous pleasure to welcome you um, here this evening for this talk by uh, Martin Lukacs um, on the reconciliation industry. It is, in a sense, um, the first, I mean, not in, just in a sense, but it is the first of two talks um, on the question of reconciliation. Um, the second one will happen um, on March uh, 10th, and it'll be uh, presented by um, Patricia Barkakis. Um, who's uh, assistant professor uh, at um, uh, UBC uh, in the law school, uh, with a uh, with a um, um, uh, comment by uh, Professor Sarah Hunt, uh, and the, the title of that talk is "Truth Before Reconciliation." So I think that um, both of these together should be really quite uh, interesting, engaging talks. So probably one of uh, the most central. Sorry. Oh, registration is, is required for that one as well. I just want to remind you, the, the, the response to this talk has, has been massive. The response to that one has also been um, tremendous. So you know, keep that in, in mind. So if you haven't already registered, uh, please do so immediately. Um, thanks again. Um, so these two talks are not just you know, the only ones that um, we have sponsored on um, uh, indigenous questions. Uh, we've actually at the Institute done quite a bit of programming uh, on um, uh, um, indigenous questions, uh, questions of settler colonialism uh, and in ind indigenous realities in, in this country and, and also um, in Central and, and Latin America. Uh, we organized a conference uh, approximately two years ago uh, entitled State of Extraction, in which um, Caleb Ben, Melissa Daniels, Richard Wright, Togasai, uh, and, and Frida uh, Houston, as well as uh, Glenn Coldhart um, participated in. Um, and we've also had more recently, um, so last year, uh, very interesting, engaging uh, talks by uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, who wrote the Indigenous uh, People's History of the United States, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, Pam Palmiter, um, the chair of Indigenous Governance, I believe, at, um, at Ryerson University, and it was also a, a fantastic, dynamic talk about um, Canada's state of emergency, um, a state of emergency that hasn't actually gone away because we now have a different government. Um, and we're going to, I'm sure, hear more about that, and we'll have lots to talk about in the, in the discussion period. So this um, question of reconciliation is one that's uh, is quite uh, near, and de near and dear to, to, to my heart um, in theoretical terms, in the kind of work um, that I do, but not probably in the way that you're perhaps thinking. Um, whenever I think about um, the idea of reconciliation, uh, I, th I think about an essay written by Theodore W. Adorno, somebody that I work on, um, an essay on uh, um, a, a namesake of, of our speaker uh, tonight, a fellow by the name of Georg Lukács. Um, and Lukács is a central figure in the history of critical theory, which is something I, I specialize on, not least because of his concept of reification, which highlights um, uh, reification also can be literally translated as thingification. So this concept highlights the way in which um, uh, under capitalist relations of production, relations between humans take on the relation, uh, take on the appearance of relation between things and vice versa. It is a concept that can assist us in particular in understanding the dehumanization uh, of indigenous peoples, of peoples of color, of trans people, uh, while also um, helping to account for um, kind of systemat systematic and structural uh, depoliticization and apathy. So it's still a, a, a very important concept, I think, in terms of understanding contemporary realities. While Adorno was influenced by uh, Lukács' concept of reification, he was also at the same time sharply critical of Lukács' socialist, social realist literary criticism, according to which uh, writers such as uh, um, Balzac were highly valued precisely because of their ability to lay bare historical conditions in their work by pointing to irresolvable contradictions within the existing relations of production and so on. 
Such forms of knowledge, according to Lukács, could be seized upon by progressive forces in their deepening antagonism to the existing order. Adorno, who was also known for his criticism of the culture industry, so I think you can, in a sense, see where this is going, the critique of um, the uh, uh, reconciliation uh, industry. Um, Adorno, who was known for his criticism of the culture industry, argued in an essay entitled Extorted Reconciliation that Lukács made a kind of reconciliation with reality. That is, he placed a wager on the historical laws of motion that would inevitably lead to the triumph of communism, of capitalism. All that was necessary was for artists to reflect such laws of motion um, uh, more or less accurately in their work. In Adorno's view, this was an extorted reconciliation, or a form of what he called reconciliation under duress, precisely because it did not embrace the critical negativity, the negative truth of history, as it were, represented in Adorno's view uh, by a different canon of, of artists, modernist canon, uh, an expressionist canon uh, of, of artists. The key thing for Adorno, though, was that this alternate counter canon represented um, express the violence and suffering contained in history uh, itself. So it's not that Adorno's thought didn't point in the direction of reconciliation. It did, and for him, and I think this is quite interesting, this meant, above all, a non-antagonistic and indeed fraternal relation between human beings and the natural world, including non-human animal life. But, then, but that, in order to get there, the labor of negativity, the labor of the negative, was required. I see this labor of the negative as being undertaken in both the talk tonight and the one that we look forward to uh, on March 10th. So before I, I move on to introduce um, uh, a, a member of, of the Squamish Nation, um, Salem, who's also a lecturer here at SFU. Um, I'm very pleased to say in um, uh, First Nations Studies and Linguistics, um, who will come up and say a few words uh, about our um, theme this evening, and will also uh, moderate the discussion after um, the, um, the talk. Now please join me in, in welcoming um, Salem. Tonight, <laughs> Reconciliation industry. How can we not quiz hope, much quiz thought to reconciliation industry? How can how can we? Well, you want hearts quiz quick quest why not to snam? To mat quite see quite ans nature. Aim and ans like when thought me chap ois ti to meo ti to not nan. Chin thought tla ans et tla ans wo amchet. uh, I just wanted to introduce myself, but also um, say a few words in the, one of the two languages of this territory. And what I shared in the language is just that uh, my name is Khal Salem, and I come from the communities of Khomopston, and I also at one point lived in the community of Aslahan, uh, and that I'm Skhotmish, from Skhotmish to Meoch, or the Skhotmish land, uh, and that I, I welcome everybody here tonight um, on behalf of myself and also um, my ancestors. Um, who are, you know, undoubtedly with us tonight. Uh, I also wanted to pay respects to my relatives uh, down the inlet from Slewit Oth, as well as my relatives from the from the Fraser um, from Chumatskuim, uh, and that this is the shared territory of our our three peoples, um, and that 
this territory that we're on, for those that don't know or may not have learned yet, is the territory for two indigenous languages. Uh, the language that I spoke just now, which is called Skhotmish, as well as uh, Hunkamitnam, which was historically spoken by the, our relatives from Khumatskwim and as well as our relatives from Slewit Olf. Uh, and then my people spoke Skhotmish. Uh, tonight is uh, an exciting opportunity, in my opinion, because I feel that this uh, concept of reconciliation goes unquestioned a, a little bit too much, uh, and then it goes unengaged critically a little too much, and that these concepts and the power that they are given, um, as we know through our history, can re wreak havoc uh, within our communities in terms of the types of relationships that are built and the types of um, changes that are proposed by different forces that are operating within, within Canada, um, but also even just within Indigenous communities. And that includes, in my opinion, people that are living within their home communities as well as people that are uh, what I've sometimes referred to as the, the Indigenous diaspora, which is Indigenous people living outside of their home territories. Um, so re reconciliation is, is um, a very pertinent topic within the context of the work that I do. Uh, I am, a, as mentioned, I'm a lecturer here at SFU, recently hired uh, in September, uh, and, and I teach in a adult Squamish language immersion program here at SFU, supported by SFU. And, but it's important to, to stress on that, that this isn't an SFU program, what I'm doing. Uh, the work that is being done the, the corpus of materials that have been developed, the language itself, and the effort that has gone into preserving and protecting and defending my language was not done by SFU. Uh, SFU is just providing a venue and some uh, accreditation um, for the students, um, but otherwise the work has been done by the Squamish people and it's important to stress that. However, uh, what's interesting, at least within my work, is that SFU as an institution is under a certain amount of um, calls, literally calls to action, um, to participate in what has been called reconciliation. And if you look at the, the CRTCs, or TRCs, CRTC, that's something else. Uh, um, but I have things to say about them too, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, the TRCs calls to action includes language. There's a bunch of sections on language, 17, 18, 19 or so. And one of them is that it calls on universities across Canada to create degree programs in Indigenous languages. And I attended a conference uh, last year um, where I was speaking on a, a, with a group of different university programs who have some form of an indigenous language program. And it was, was kind of like a panel, but there was like five groups. Uh, and we were to respond to the inquiry about what, in our opinion, reconciliation would look like in the university context as people who are doing language work, uh, particularly around the, the TRC's calls to action. And there was one speaker who said that, in their opinion, reconciliation would look like uh, universities having just as many faculty for indigenous languages as they do for English and French. At the bare minimum, that's what reconciliation could look like. There's many other things that they said, but that was one example of what reconciliation could look like. And if you were to compare, in SFU right now, how many faculty are employed to teach English or French within the, within the institution compared to how many that are employed to teach indigenous languages, let alone um, tenured positions. I, I'm a lecturer, so I'm a limited term position, but you get the idea that there is, a, there is an inequity there. So what I would say about, to frame part of what I want to introduce to people about reconciliation is uh, I, I see a bit of a spectrum on a debate about it, at least within the indigenous community. I think by and large, in my opinion, in my experience, uh, reconciliation is not the, uh, the cry of indigenous peoples in most indigenous communities. It is not what you know, youth in northern communities are calling for and demanding of the government. It's not what people, it's not what the young people or the people who are, are, who are demanding justice in my community are crying out for. Uh, reconciliation is by and large a white settler movement. Uh, and what's really fascinating about that for me though is that if you were to take a scan of who are the people doing work of reconciliation, like who are the, who are the, the ground forces? Uh, who are the people on the ground doing this work? Where are resources being put to this? Where is time being put into this? either uh, t uh, resources in terms of like actual cash, in terms of funding, but also 
I would include people who are like volunteering their time for this as well. And surprisingly, uh, what I find is that the, the, the main institutions that are kind of doing this are education institutions and churches. Um, are churches slash uh, institutions of faith. And I've met many people from different uh, faiths and different churches, uh, you know, in Vancouver and across Canada, who are organizing some form of reconciliation within their church at, a, at, at the grassroots level, not at the higher level within the organization, but very much at the grassroots level. Um, and then the other one is the education institutions. So universities are under enormous pressures now to um, participate in reconciliation, and there's a whole bunch of ways in which universities are responding to that. One of them is, you know, became really famous in the media is the requirement for indigenous content within, uh, within courses, or specifically indigenous course requirements of all students within, within the university, and there's a lot of debate around that. But what I would say about reconciliation and the way that I tend to engage with it is that I don't dismiss it as a wholly um, useless concept. Um, and, and the reason that I, I, I don't or I have chosen not to is because I actually do see that there is power behind it. And I engage with it as uh, a power structure that it has been created or not created actually has, has um, kind of re been rebranded, really. Um, and so, you know, I, I think about, there's a quote from a TV show, and I don't have to name it for people that are as nerdy as me and might know it, um, but, you know, power resides where people think it resides. And reconciliation has power because people place power in it. And the, and the way that I know that to be true, or at least the way I feel that is true, is that reconciliation is this interesting thing where five years ago, certain types of conversations that were really difficult to move in any direction are all of a sudden possible when you throw reconciliation into it. Uh, and I, I experienced that within the university, that certain conversations that people have been trying to have within the post-secondary, across not just SFU, I mean across the board, all of a sudden are, are a little bit more possible now. Um, and we also see this with uh, government and, and a little bit with industry, where, where reconciliation is the way that they are branding um, what is essentially settler colonialism still, um, but rebranding it as this benevolent uh, relationship building between indigenous nations. And, they'll, and you know, they're starting to brand it as nation to nation and all these things as well. But it is still, in my opinion, it's just a rebranding of the same process that was in effect, trying to get at our resources and trying to um, change the people on the land or the people who have the rights to the land to change the people so that they can get access to those resources. Those are all, that's ultimately still the process that is unfolding and that reconciliation has just become the new form of that in many places, in many places around Canada. Now the other side of it though is that you got institutions like, like the university that are, are trying to answer the question of Essentially, how do you build a relationship with Indigenous people? And in my opinion, that is a worthwhile question when it comes to accountability. How do we get institutions with power to be accountable to Indigenous people? And I tend to think of um, reconciliation as a watered down uh, version of justice. That the calls for justice for, from Indigenous people have been ongoing for 150 years. Uh, if, or, or longer, but Canada didn't exist that, um, before that. But we're in this phase now where we are being, we're again being inundated uh, with calls for Indigenous people to change, and very few calls for settler society to change or settler institutions to change. And for me, the way that I often frame uh, reconciliation with people is that if, and the way I challenge it, and this is what I'll leave you on, the note that I'll leave you on is that I feel that reconciliation is controlled by the people who control that conversation. And if we leave that to industry and we leave that to um, very pro-colonialist forces, then that becomes the dominant conversation through this kind of, this vessel that has been created. Uh, but I often challenge people and I say that um, if reconciliation doesn't include decolonization, then it's not reconciliation. Uh, I'll even challenge people further that if reconciliation doesn't include um, resisting white supremacy, then it's not reconciliation. And that if you aren't being unsettled, literally, um, by the process of reconciliation, then it's not reconciliation. And I frame it that way because, like I said, I think that the, the, the concept is, is an empty vessel that we're, whatever we pour into it, it becomes. And that's my experience with it so far. 
And if you look at where the conversation is having or is being had, it's mostly places that have money. Like First Nations, like First Nations across the country that have own source revenue, how much money are they putting into reconciliation? None. But institutions, ed education systems, industry, government, they're the ones that are throwing reconciliation dollars at things. And by virtue of that, they get to control the type of conversation that is had and the type of work that comes out of it. But I think that we're in a unique place where we can respond and perhaps um, introduce, or in introduce some interventions that actually challenge people and uproot um, the dominant kind of power structures. And hopefully, it becomes a place to do that. I don't know. Um, but I am interested in engaging with it that way because I think that there is something, it opens up something specifically for what I would call um, like uh, Canadian liberalism and, 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 and mainstream white liberals within Canadian society. That reconciliation actually for some strange reason is a way to open up a conversation with those, that, that crowd. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious as how to engage with that. I'm curious how to maintain our integrity while doing that. Um, and seeing if there is an opportunity to, to, to push the envelope uh, and, 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 and try to create some substantial change and benefit for our communities. And I, I, I don't know how to do that across the board. I only know how to do that within my field, which is uh, within languages. And, and I, I feel like there might be some success there. But I am interested to hear from others around what people think about, is it possible to do that? Is it worthwhile to do that? And what's the risk of not doing that? So that's kind of my thoughts around this, and I'm, I'm excited to hear, hear this, this critical engagement around the reconciliation industry, and I look forward to this conversation uh, unfolding and, and evolving and expanding so that it's not, uh, you know, puppies and unicorns um, out there when we talk about reconciliation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kusuelem. Um Really look forward to your um, questions and comments in the, um, in, in the, the context of the, the Q&A that follows the lecture. So uh, without any further ado, I really want to um, get on to introducing uh, our, our speaker for this evening. But before I do, uh, I'd just like to say that um, the, um, the event tonight is uh, co-sponsored uh, with Media Mornings. Um, uh, co-presented co uh, by Media Mornings, co-sponsored um, by um, the Simon Fraser uh, Public Interest Research Group, um, uh, SFU's First Nations Studies, uh, SFU's Department of History and uh, School of Public Policy and rabble.ca. Uh, um, a special thank you to Erwin Ostindi um, for his help uh, and also, as always, uh, Vianne Pham for um, all the work she does for, for the Institute. Um, so without any further ado, uh, it gives me tremendous pleasure to um, introduce uh, Martin Lukacs, who is a journalist um, writing for the um, British uh, newspaper, The Guardian, and one of the authors and organizers of the Leap Manifesto. He's been involved in, uh, with movements for social and ecological justice and collective liberation for 15 years. He lives in uh, Montreal. Um, and the title of this talk is The Reconciliation Industry, Land Dispossession and Extractivism in an Age of Official Contrition. Uh, one second before I invite Martin up here, I just have to make a note. Um, it's right at the bottom of my page. Uh, that we're filming an event, as you can see. Um, and we'll also be um, filming the uh, commenters and, and, and questioners from the audience. If you don't wish to be uh, filmed when you're asking a question or making your comment, just please uh, put your hand up and let the videographer know and we can just uh, uh, make an adjustment. So please join me in welcoming uh, Martin Lukacs. Good evening, everybody. You have to be happy when an uh, introduction takes an etymological turn. Um, I admit to being very happy that my, uh, when my last name gets pronounced correctly. Um, and I know that I can often rely on a very small group of people to do that, uh, old school Marxists, who are familiar with the obscure writings of uh, George Lukacs. Um, but I was sorry to, to disappoint um, Samir that um, there's actually no uh, blood relationship to George Lukacs, nor really a political one, since I'm, I'm more an anarchist than a, than a Marxist. Um, 
but there was some, some ped pedagogical ones since his, his disciples taught my mother in Hungary. Um, uh, thank you for, for inviting me to do the talk and, and, and Hu Yan as well from the Institute for organizing, um, organizing it and inviting me to be part of such a fantastic uh, series that is so well organized. Um, I, uh, I have to admit to being uh, a little disappointed that Vancouver is rolling out the white carpet for me. I was planning to, to be an escapee from central Canadian weather, um, but apparently there's gonna be snow on Thursday and in Montreal it's 13 degrees and sunny. Um, but I, I, I do admit I will never succumb to the, the West Coast habit of, the very curious West Coast habit of using umbrellas for snow. <laughs> That's, that's just not right. Um, uh, I'm grateful to Khalsilam for, for his introductory uh, remarks and his, um, his insight into the question of reconciliation, um, and also for the, the work that you're doing around uh, language revitalization. Uh, I just found out while talking to him, to him before that he is the great grandson of Andy Paul, who um, was an absolute uh, political titan when it came to struggles for indigenous rights. And it, to me, it explains a lot about the, the leadership uh, that Kilsilam shows as well. Uh, Andy Paul, in the, in the days when organizing for indigenous rights was illegal, uh, he used to uh, organize sporting events like baseball uh, and, and, and slip in the organizing through the actual sporting associations at events to kind of elude uh, the gaze of uh, the RCMP and Canadian officials. And he really laid the groundwork uh, for a lot of the indigenous struggles that uh, continue to this day. Uh, I also want to yeah, acknowledge being a visitor here on uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territory. Um, acknowledgements for me aren't, um, I mean, they're, they're, a, they're a, it's about you know, good manners as a settler on this land. Um, but I think it's, it's also important to be an exhortation to go beyond words, um, to be a kind of pedagogical reminder um, about the people who have stewarded these lands for thousands of years, and, um, and also a call to action to go beyond words, um, to commit to following uh, the leadership of indigenous peoples as they protect the territories uh, that we are fortunate enough to uh, live on together. As I, was, um, as I was preparing this talk, there was a, a person who was often on my mind, uh, Arthur Emanuel. Um, Arthur was a Shishwap activist, uh, writer, uh, visionary, uh, who became an ancestor this January at the age of uh, 66. Um, I imagine many, many of you have heard, heard of him or heard him speak or uh, even knew him personally. Um, <laughs> I had the, the honor of working with Art uh, over the course of a decade uh, through an organization called the Defenders of the Land, which was a group uh, primarily of rural uh, indigenous activists involved in land struggle. And I was one of a, sm a small number of, of settler allies uh, who worked with this group. Um, th those who came into contact with Art knew him as, as a real intellectual giant. Um, he had a, a really big heart, um, an incredible generosity to mentor and teach people, indigenous and non-indigenous alike, and he had a wicked sense of humor. Um, I remember Art actually took me to my first Assembly of First Nations meeting in Calgary, and um, there kind of hopped up on the analysis that he had been sharing with me on, uh, on my ride, on the ride over from BC to, to Calgary. I remember trying to ask uh, AFN chief Phil Fontaine at the time a really like honest, tough question and, uh, and was promptly shoved aside by one of Phil Fontaine's bodyguards. Uh, and, and, and Art was there on the sidelines kind of knowingly chuckling. Um, and it, it was through such experiences working with Art, um, that I discovered that one can learn um, far more about the nature of Canadian society by spending um, and sharing in a small way the life uh, of its victims, of its survivors, of its rebels, radicals, and dissenters, 
than one ever can by intellectually interacting you know, with privileged ac academics and uh, politicians and pundits. Um, uh, the, the, till the, the very day that Art uh, was taken to the hospital, uh, he was still sending out organizing emails, working furiously on building up uh, a new front of resistance to the Kinder Morgan pipeline, um, Tarsan's pipeline, uh, fighting till his very last breath to protect the land and water that we all rely on. I learned from Art, as, as, so, as did so many others, that indigenous land rights are a powerful transformative tool. Um, the single biggest obstacle to wanton and careless resource development in this country, and ultimately, the greatest nonviolent weapon to protect the land and climate for everyone. And I think Art's vision can unlock a kind of deeper understanding of, of, of reconciliation, what it can be, what it isn't. Um, Art was, Art was preoccupied with the central fact that underlies indigenous people's poverty, uh, that underlies Canada's very existence, uh, that has been dressed up for centuries in all manners of religious, civilizational, and racial rationales so as to discuss anything but the naked fact itself, a fact over which Canada's establishment to this day twists themselves in elaborate intellectual and moral knots to avoid, a secret that is nevertheless wide in the open, a vast and enduring violence that is scarcely spoken of, the dispossession of indigenous people's lands and territories. Art never failed to remind people of the fact that indigenous people's control of the land amounts to 0.2% and that non-indigenous people control 99.8% of that. He thought, that if we don't understand and grapple with the dispossession of indigenous people's lands, a dispossession that is unfolding today, um, a dispossession over which a massive federal state presides and legally maintains, and through its spies and police, and sometimes even its military, military violently protects, that we risk being taken in by the reconciliation industry that is developing around us. Reconciliation will remain a cruel joke if non-Indigenous people do not confront this fundamental reason that lies behind all the abuse perpetrated on Indigenous peoples, including but not limited to the residential schools. That reason is simple and unchanged, clearing all barriers to control over the land and access to resources. I think if we see Canada from the standpoint that Art did, um, through what some of, our, some of his friends like to joke was his colonial bullshit detector, um, we can see everything a lot more clearly. What, what made art so special wasn't, um, is that, is that he, didn't merely he didn't merely stop at declaring the fact of this possession. He spent a lot of his time trying to find the kind of vulnerable weak spots of the colonial state. Um, and he was one of the most brilliant strategists uh, I had ever met. I like to call him uh, an economic hitman for the right cause. He, um, he knew that if Canada coveted indigenous people's lands and resources more than anything else, then we should fight Canada on the terms that it best understood, on the terms that would hurt it the most in its pocketbook. His line of attack was to try to lift the veil on Canada's dirty business secret. That contrary to the myth that indigenous peoples leech off the state, um, it's in fact the resources taken from their lands that have been subsidizing Canada's economy. And in their haste to get at that wealth, the government has been flouting their own laws, um, ignoring Supreme Court decisions like Dalgamug and Chillicotin that call for the respect of Aboriginal title and rights. And the result was, as Art always used to say, um, as inevitable as it was unjustifiable, that Canada had become very rich and indigenous peoples very poor. Um, one, of, one of Art's long-term projects was to quantify exactly what the sum of the stolen resources amounted to. Um, and this was one of his unfinished projects uh, that he had been in correspondence with um, the Nobel Prize-winning economist Joseph Stiglitz. Um, 
though the calculations never got done, we do have some um, for First Nations in Northern Ontario alone. The amount owed, as calculated by one economist, was $32 billion for the last century of unfulfilled treaty promises to share revenue from resources. Um, so another thing that Art did was, uh, with his organization, the Indigenous Network on Economies and Trade, he became the first Indigenous organization to intervene uh, at NAFTA. Um, so he, he literally took the fight to uh, the most powerful uh, financial institutions um, of the global elite. Uh, when there was a softwood lumber dispute uh, between Canada and the United States, he basically intervened on the side of the US, uh, arguing that Canada was basically, by not recognizing Aboriginal rights and title, was creating an illegal and invisible subsidy to the Canadian economy. Really ingenious. And uh, NAFTA actually accepted this submission, um, and it was entered uh, as a recognizable unfair trade advantage. On another occasion, Art uh, engaged Standard & Poor's, um, which is basically the world's top credit agency, and he was able to secure a meeting with them in New York. Basically, Standard & Poor's um, issues Canada's and BC's like top-notch AAA rating. Um, and that's basically what assures investors that the country has its debts covered, uh, that it's a safe and profitable place to do, to do business. And Art wanted to show that, in fact, Canada doesn't have its debts covered, um, that the unpaid debt to Indigenous peoples for the theft of their land and resources, a massive liability of trillions of dollars carried by the Canadian state, which it has deliberately failed to report to these agencies, should be recognized as a risk. And the point was that um, if Indigenous peoples hold a key to the Canadian economy, they could use this as leverage to steer the country in a different direction. A few years ago, Art told me, if we can draw that power back to the people on the land, then the gra to the grassroots people fighting industrial developments, pipelines, mining projects, um, that will determine what governments can and can't do on the land. You know, the lessons that, that, um, that Art learned, that many of us learned from him, um, showed us that truth on its own is not that useful, right? Power doesn't really care about the truth, um, unless that truth is backed up by power itself, um, backed up by the force of hard economic reality. And he knew that these were the truths that had to be reckoned with before reconciliation of any, of any kind, of any meaningful, any meaningful sense would ever become possible. Um, and Art also knew that at the very highest levels, the Canadian government, the provincial government were tracking, um, tracking the potential disruptive power of these rights. Um, the BC government, for instance, are brilliantly noted uh, in their yearly annual reports. They actually, they actually include a ledger um, um, where they note that they have contractual and contingent liabilities when it comes to indigenous title and rights and ongoing land claims processes. And in plain English, that basically means that they know they have serious liabilities, but they have them covered, right? So, and namely that's through the BC treaty process, the British Columbia treaty process. Um, that treaty process, uh, instead of recognizing Aboriginal rights and title, seeks to extinguish them basically ensuring certainty over the land, uh, ensuring unhindered corporate access, and clearing up those liabilities for good. Art didn't, Art didn't mince words about the BC treaty process, and I don't think we should either. Um, like the comprehensive land claims negotiations that happen in other parts of the country where treaties have never been signed and title has never been surrendered, it was basically part of a final colonial conquest. It threw First Nations into massive amounts of debt. I think in BC it's, it's top $500 million. Um, debts that are accrued through doing research and preparing for negotiations. Um, and as a precondition for any eventual compensation or settlement, um, they have to extinguish their rights to nine out of every 10 parcels of their land. That's rivers, forests, mountains, farmland, and absolutely everything underneath. Art 
passionately argue that indigenous leaders should walk away from what he called go nowhere negotiations. Um, because by staying in them, they were serving as the first line of defense against criticism. And um, back in 2013, with the help of our um, a close friend of his named Shiri Manuel, who's a Shiri, sorry, Shiri Pasternak, who's a, a really brilliant academic and activist, um, uncovered basically a, a secret federal program that was monitoring the risk uh, of indigenous rights. Um, and in those docs, in the kind of clinical language of bureaucracy, uh, it laid out the kind of brute reality. Um, that these documents basically said, quote, there is a tension between the rights-based agenda of Aboriginal groups and the non-rights-based policy approaches of the federal government. Um, and basically tracked the significant risks to its agenda that were posed by treaty rights, by the rising expectations of social movements and indigenous communities, um, and all these new legal precedents that were at odds with their agenda. And what this threatened, of course, was 650 billion dollars of investment that the conservative government and now the liberal government um, covet uh, when it comes to extraction in mining, forestry, gas, and oil. Um, and art was a kind of close study of the mechanics by which uh, these risks were contained. Um, the federal government, you know, spends a hundred million dollars every year uh, on. Uh, just legally fighting indigenous communities and their rights. Um, the buy-offs that the government would deploy, both provincially, federally, and corporations, got bigger and bigger every year. Uh, we know the Luxwalan in Northwest BC were offered more than a billion dollars for an LNG plant, um, which they heroically refused. Um, the spying of indigenous communities and activists has got more and more widespread. Um, Ten years ago, the government created a new surveillance, uh, new surveillance program that basically tracks what it calls hotspots um, for uh, conditions of native unrest. Um, basically, communities protesting unwanted extraction on their lands. And when that didn't work, of course, indigenous communities are criminalized and, and shuttled off to jail, um, as Art experienced himself uh, during the resistance his community put up to the Sun Peaks Resort several years ago. In a country built on, on dispossession, these Aboriginal rights um, pose a huge risk to the status quo. And they were really a specter haunting the land. And Art, in many ways, um, through his work, made that specter grow louder, uh, louder and louder. Um, you know, when Art, Art passed away, the premier of BC and the federal government uh, paid their respects. Um, I don't think it's something that they would have ever dared to do uh, during his life. Uh, he was, he was simply, too, simply too dangerous to them. Um, and the irony is that both in Christy Clark's statement and Carolyn Bennett's, they cited Art as an effective advocate of lasting reconciliation. Um, when Art was always a bitter, bitter opponent to the kind of uh, reconciliation they certainly were proposing. Reconciliation is the, is the kind of watchword of the era, a, a notion that seems so universally uncontested um, that it's part of a kind of comfortable political consensus. It has a force, it almost seems to have a force and momentum of its own, as if on its own it will usher in a new era um, of relations between indigenous and non-indigenous people. In, in many ways, reconciliation is kind of like the notion of Canada itself, inevitably good and necessary. Um, Canada as a tolerant and multicultural beacon, a peaceable kingdom of reason, harmony, and accommodation. Um, I think it's a notion that people are clinging to even more uh, in this era of increasing division uh, and hatred, certainly south of the border. Um, but reconciliation, like Canada itself, obviously has a history uh, that's quite different than this civic cartoon. Um, indigenous scholars Glenn Coulthard and Audra Simpson um, have kind of brilliantly tracked the emergence of the reconciliation discourse. Um, it emerges 
as a response to uh, increased resistance and resurgence from about the 1980s onward. Um, it pops up first uh, in response uh, or at the tail end of the, of the Royal Commission on Ab Aboriginal Peoples in a reconciliation statement that the Liberal government put out. Um, it appears in Supreme Court decisions like Haida and Chilcotin, um, in the official apology, of course, and then it's taken full form in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and now, you know, since the Trudeau election, I think uh, it has been pumped up like never before, and it's taking central stage in you know, the 150th uh, birthday celebrations. Um, and in a kind of political moment when reconciliation has such shape-shifting meaning, art had a way of kind of cutting to the essence of things. Uh, in an unpublished note, he wrote this about reconciliation uh, in his kind of characteristic um, humor. Uh, the term reconciliation now covers any and all manipulations or diminutions of our rights. The government and the Canadian people have fallen in love with reconciliation. They don't really seem to understand the concept, but they truly love that word. <laughs> Everything is reconciliation. When they join a round dance, they call that reconciliation. When they tear up in discussing our poverty, that's reconciliation. At the same time, when they are denying our constitutional rights, they call that recognition, reconciliation. In fact, every new plan to steal from us is called reconciliation. That is what has become in the hands of, that is what it, reconciliation has become in the hands of Trudeau the Younger, and sadly they are finding allies among our people. And I think Art was right to talk about this grand deception that's unfolding, the kind of birth of a reconciliation industry, um, whereby we have a colonial state that refuses to relinquish any power over indigenous peoples or its claims to indigenous lands but performs elaborate rhetorical and symbolic gestures of contrition, even of sorrow, generating superficial repair and even cultural accommodation, but also mask masking ongoing control and violence, indeed strengthening it by clothing it in a new disguise. You know, it was Harper who kind of inaugurated the era of reconciliation. Um, but since he was barely able to veil his contempt for indigenous peoples, he never really became a very good practitioner of reconciliation industry politics. But it's no surprise that the liberal government have become the absolute masters of this form. Trudeau, in many ways, is liberalism perfected. Um, he's a hipster harper. He's a walking and talking TED talk. Um, he's the maple wash colonist. Um, and yes, a white supremacist wrapped in Matt Damon's body. <laughs> Liberalism is perfected in him, I think, because the basic colonization project continues without respite. Um, but Trudeau is just so sensitive and woke about it. Um, and I think we've seen that since Trudeau came to power, the reconciliation industry's expansion has really begun in earnest. Um, so for instance, this past fall, the BC Treaty Commission, which oversees the BC Treaty process that Art fought so passionately against, launched a new campaign. BC Treaty negotiations, it turns out, embody reconciliation, uh, leading to, quote, the highest expression of reconciliation, constitutionally entrenched modern treaties. Treaty making in BC, according to this campaign, is an opportunity for the governments of Canada, BC, and First Nations to lead the world in reconciliation. When the federal government came down with their decision on the liquefied natural gas terminal in Luxembourg territory, which was you know, fiercely resisted by indigenous peoples and others, um, that too was reconciliation. Um, in case people were confused uh, about the government's decision to approve this basically carbon bomb, uh, Canada's environment minister, Catherine McKenna, was there to say that, in fact, it was based on traditional indigenous knowledge and would be in keeping in line with Canada's reconciliation agenda. Um, the Liberal government is actually currently preparing its next big reconciliation unveil, um, perhaps the most politically impactful in terms of uh, undermining indigenous rights, um, under what it calls a reconciliation table process. The federal government is currently holding 40 
exploratory negotiations, negotiations with 240 First Nations, um, basically on how to expand these modern treaties to extinguish land rights uh, that Art fought so hard against. Um, there what Russ Dybo, who's a really terrific um, Mohawk policy analyst, calls termination tables, um, because they're essentially dispossession uh, by negotiation, and they too now are being repackaged as reconciliation. Art wrote that this was no way to actually achieve reconciliation. He, he, he said, to truly reconcile Aboriginal and Crown title, Canada and the provinces would first have to recognize and affirm our rights on the ground. Then we can negoti negotiate a binding agreement about the details of implementation. Anything less is not reconciliation, but surrender. Um, as Kelsillan was, was saying, industry has also gone in on the action. Um, the, the main lobbying group in Canada, the Pro Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, now regularly trumpets its reconciliation. Uh, two weeks from now, they're actually hosting their national convention um, where they'll have a forum on reconciliation. Um, and they'll be talking about how to create mutually beneficial relationships when it comes to sustaining a uh, successful mining industry. And it'll be followed by a networking meeting hosted by Fast and Martineau which for the lawyers uh, in the room is probably the, the favored legal firm of companies like Barrick Gold, um, who we know have such a, a fine commitment to indig indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and Kel Slim actually wrote a piece in, in 2013 where he, he also pointed out the absurdity of TransCanada, you know, the same company that um, wants to jeopardize the coastal livelihoods of so many people, um, was funding a reconciliation event in Vancouver. Um, there's also been a mini boom in corporate and government cultural competency trainings. Um, as one such provider details on their website, the truth and reconciliation industry has, quote, triggered an opportunity for entrepreneurial types to set themselves up as indigenous awareness and cultural competency providers. And they offer, um, they offer uh, free weekly um, training tips uh, on Tuesdays, to which you can subscribe to and unsubscribe at any time, um, which is nice, like decolonizing by subscribing to a blog. And if it becomes too overwhelming, then just unsubscribe. Um, I mean, of course, and you know, the Ontario government has also, for instance, introduced these competency trainings. Um, uh, you know, this is the same, same Ontario government who fought tooth and nail to refuse to clean up Grassy Narrows water, um, which after a 50-year fight, they were finally forced to do so. Uh, the news came out a few weeks ago. Um, so one has, to, one has to wonder what these, um, what these cultural competency trainings uh, uh, achieve, if not... Um, just to create a, a, a sense of, of, of enhanced, in, enhanced sensitivity. Um, more than anything else, I think for the federal government, reconciliation has become a kind of rhetorical and symbolic strategy, as you, you started to outline. Um, and we all know that Justin Trudeau and his government are the masters of symbolism. They've closely studied Obama. Um, they have an even more expensive and centralized communications branch than, than Harper did, and Harper himself had massively expanded it. Um, we also know that this story is, is starting to unravel. Um, and even Trudeau's official platform has kind of started to fray. So we know that um, the compensation for 16,000 individuals who were snatched from their homes and adopted as part of the, the 60s scoop um, the Trudeau government opposed that in court, even though they were finally defeated recently. Um, a legal order that had been issued to the liberals um, to end racial discrimination against indigenous children, that had been repeatedly ignored. Um, that historic budget for First Nations that we heard so much about, the $8.4 billion, um, that too turned out that it was merely additions to existing programs and services and would only flow in 2020, conveniently enough, after the next election. Um, not exactly the new relationship that Trudeau announced to rapturous international applause. Um, in fact, this Tuesday, uh, sorry, this Thursday will be the 10th anniversary 
of the case launched by Cindy Blackstock uh, to get the government to stop discriminating uh, against ind Indigenous children when it comes to the provision of on-reserve social programs and services. That's 10 years of delay and deceit and attrition, 10 years of subpar education and welfare and healthcare, 10 years of unneeded suffering among Indigenous children. Could there be, could there be a more elemental expression of non-reconciliation than this shameless squandering uh, of the well-being of Indigenous children? But Trudeau truly cares. We're, we're always encouraged to remember that. Um, it's, what's, it's, what, it's what Audra Simpson describes as the emotional performance of singular contrition. And no one does it better than Trudeau, especially when he's, when he's dabbing, dabbing his eyes of tears. Um, watching Trudeau shed tears at politically opportune moments has often brought to my mind a saying that exists in Israeli society. And I think which tells us a great deal about the uses to which Trudeau's tears get put. Um, the saying is uh, Yorem Vebochim. Um, which in Hebrew basically means shooting and crying. Um, and it refers to how soldiers of the occupying Israeli army often shed ost ostentatious tears to relieve them of their sense of guilt and demonstrate their moral depth. So this term um, emerged after the 1967 war um, in which Israel um, precipitated a war with its Arabic neighbors. Um, and it was a resounding victory in six days, at the end of which Israel occupied the Palestinian ter ter territories that it continues to occupy. Um, and there was a documentary that was made after that war in which soldiers kind of cried on camera. Um, and a notion emerged in that moment that has become very useful to the settler society in Israel. This notion that because Israeli soldiers cry, the Israeli army is the most moral army in the world. Um, they shoot, but then they cry, and so their actions must be moral. Um, and this notion's been explored in uh, Israeli culture and film and literature and song. Um, one of the most recent films, which people may have seen, is Walt with Bashir, um, which plays on this, on this kind of meme. Um, and it is regularly invoked to defend Israel's atro atrocious human rights violations against Palestinians. Um, and you know, in recent years, the Israeli military, who's kind of gotten high on their own, own propaganda, has rolled out policies for its soldiers in the occupied territories that kind of take these myths to their logical extension. Um, so at checkpoints established illegally on Palestinian territory um, that you know, prevent freedom of movement for Palestinians and undermine their economy, um, soldiers follow an ethical, ethical code of behavior. Um, and more generally, in the territories, there is a human human policy for treating Palestinians. Um, and then the so-called security wall, which has uh, basically carved out more of the Palestinian land in the 67 uh, territories, um, and kind of carved away Palestinian farmland and olive groves. Uh, that security wall, in their language, requires human assistance. Um, it's, never, it's never the policies and measures at the root of the violence that are subjected to this supposed exacting kind of moral standard over which tears are shed. But it's, it's merely the policy's consequences, and only some of them. Um, and these tears basically function as a kind of salty misinformation, a consolidation of the hypocrisy at the core of unjustifiable occupation. Um, and they also have another aim. They, it has a, there's a kind of a logic of white, white supremacy to it, which is that we cry because we respect the value of life in contrast to them, right? who worship the culture of death. Um, and by crying at the result of our actions, rather than reckoning with how we might stop those actions, we arrange for ourselves to be the central narrators of this enduring history of violence, narrating it in a way that, again, bespeaks our moral superiority. Does that sound at all familiar what's happening in Canada? Um, I mean, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that people shouldn't cry. I like to cry every day, if possible. <laughs> I think it's healthy. Um, but I think it's entirely different when someone continues to keep crying about something that they have an inordinate amount of power to change. Um, I think as Justin Trudeau, that Trudeau does. And in his case, I think the tears function to bathe him and bathe settler, settler Canada in this renewed innocence. 
basically colonizing and crying is what Trudeau's up to. He's the, he's the woke colonizer. Um, as Leanne Simpson has written of him, he's the colonizer who smudges. But, but a smudgier dispossession is still dispossession. I also think that, that, that this trend in Canadian politics didn't start with, um, didn't start with Trudeau. It probably started with Paul Martin, um, who, as many people know, after he was done as prime minister, he became a very passionate advocate for indigenous peoples. Um, he, was never, he never saw fit to critique the policies that he himself had presided over, like the 2% funding cap that he imposed, like the continuing policies of dispossession. But he was often very, very concerned with the, the state and welfare, especially of indigenous children. Um, and he's launched all kinds of business and educational initiatives in indigenous communities, um, which in my mind are mostly about insinuating kind of capitalist, capitalist kind of um, a capitalist ethos um, and promoting business ventures by which he, he, he stands to profit hugely. Um, but but what, Martin, what Martin started, Trudeau kind of refined to, a, to an art form. Um, and I actually think too that like in this age of official contrition, Trudeau is, is, mo is, is starting to model a very dangerous kind of cultural posture um, that I think could catch on much more widely. Um, and I think, so, so I think while it's still, it's still in its kind of gestation phase, um, I think we shouldn't mince words about it. It, it. It's nothing more than a cynical gesture that cloaks a really brutal and manipulative system. And it can never, never be a stand-in for real justice. Um, in many ways, if Trudeau is like the perfect uh, politician, then the liberal government has in many ways been the perfect vehicle for this kind of reconciliation industry. Um, they are absolute masters at turning the language of liberation into, the, into contraptions, of, uh, contraptions of conquest. Um, they, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s when the indigenous struggle for genuine self-government was coming to the fore, the federal government started using that language as well of self-government. Um, but it means absolutely the opposite. Um, indigenous critics often refer to the kind of self-government that the liberal government offers as nothing more than ethnic municipalities. Um, modern treaties, of course, the much valued modern treaties are nothing more than about extinguishment. And the full box of section 35 rights that the government often talks about is in truth just an empty box. Um, it is always an upside down world um, in liberal land. Um, and you know, their, their latest utterances have been just as soothing. Um, We've heard them talk not just about reconciliation, but about nation to nation relationships, even about decolonization. Um, and I would say the most slippery of all of their uses has been their, their discussion of consent. Though the liberals have, as we all know, supported the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, they've been loath to actually recognize it on the ground. Um, free, prior, free prior informed consent is such a simple phrase and yet it sends such shudders uh, through corporate boardrooms everywhere. Um, so, you know, when the Harper, the Harper government had been adamantly opposed to it, um, and when Trudeau finally uh, said that they would endorse it, there was rapturous applause. Um, but what was interesting is that a few days before the Canadian government agreed to, to endorse and implement the UN Declaration, the NDP's Romeo Saganesh had actually introduced a private member's bill that would, in a very simple and straightforward fashion, commit the government to full implementation of the UN Declaration. Um, and that Bill, bill 262 is still traveling through Parliament, and you can um, support the campaign to, to, to push it forward. Um, but it was interesting that when that was announced, the Liberal government kind of coughed, shuffled some papers, and they said, it's, it won't be necessary because we're developing a Canadian definition of the UN Declaration. What's the a, what's a Canadian de de definition? Is it like, look, we're not going to respect your rights, but we'll be, pro you know, we'll be polite and orderly about it. Um, of course, the principle that they, are, that they are scared of is what's at the core of the UN Declaration, and that's the right of Indigenous peoples to epic and, and money, as, a, as a, someone just pointed out. Um, it's the right to say no, right? Um, and what was interesting is that not long after that, probably because they realized that their, 
their PR on this front wasn't working that well. The Trudeau government, um, it came out that they were considering a so-called model of collaborative consent. So what, what's, what, what, what's collaborative consent? Is that like, we say yes, you say no. Okay, look, so we'll meet halfway, split the difference, and go with yes. Um, consent is consent, right? Like, it has to be free, prior, and informed. Anything less is a fundamental denial of the inherent rights of indigenous peoples. Um, and indigenous feminists have been making a really brilliant analogy here. Whether it's bodies or territories, if you don't have the actual power to say no, then consent is meaningless. Um, and there's a great report put out by the Native Youth Sexual Health Network called Violence Against Our Bodies, Violence Against the Land that I would recommend to everyone. Um, I mean, really what in, really what in, in, the, in this kind of, um, in this kind of form, it seems like reconciliation is about is about maintaining control, right? Um, so Trudeau himself said publicly not long after this that EFIC doesn't give indigenous peoples the right to say no. Um, you know, for this globally recognized feminist, it seems like the principles of consent are a bit confusing. Um, and what's interesting is the Pope just a few weeks ago, uh, he came out in support of free prior informed consent in relationship to what's happening in Standing Rock. Uh, which basically means Justin has been outflanked on the feminist left by a religious leader who heads an institution that isn't exactly known as a paragon of respect of women. Um, and not only has Trudeau indicated he will set the parameters of reconciliation, but he started to talk about reconciliation um, well beyond the four-year electoral term. So he said, look, this is an engagement that is going to take years, decades, and generations even, perhaps. Um, is that what Trudeau meant when he said we're gonna, the government's going to start thinking uh, seven generations out? Is that seven generations of delay? Um, I think what I think is, I mean, as Kelsillan was saying, especially like there, there is this battle to determine <coughs> what reconciliation means, um, and the government seems to think that the group that commits the grievances repeatedly and continually gets to determine what reconciliation means for the grieved parties. Um, and I think this is, a, this is part of a, a long, I mean, this fight over who gets to determine what reconciliation is, is just the law, is just, you know, the latest skirmish in this long war that colonial Canada has fought to decide who indigenous peoples are, what their rights are, and what should become of them. Um, and I think that the, the Joseph Boyden saga actually is, is instructive here. It was really fascinating to watch um, the pundits, the book publishers, the award juries, and the conference organizers, really the, the, the full force of the kind of white cultural industry in this country line up behind Boyden. Um, and it was interesting to watch them kind of caricature what in Indian country had been a very sophisticated and compassionate debate about responsibility, about accountability, about belonging, as just a debate about blood, blood quantum. Um, and I think the most extreme but also revealing response came from a Globe and Mail pundit, uh, Conrad Yakubuski. Um, I don't know if people remember this article, but basically he described grotesquely the criticisms of Boyd Boyden as, as a lynching. Um, and he wrote, Yakubuski wrote in the article that his, the Canadian part of his identity had needed some refreshment and refinement, and he had found that in Boyden's novels. Boyden had basically been his guide into Canada and he now utterly resented critics um, who he called an angry mob of identity politics. Um, and it's no doubt that it feels like violence to some of the white elite in this country. Um, but what this freak out is really about, I think, is this creeping realization, mostly unconscious or perhaps semi-conscious, semi that non-native people may be losing control over their ability to set the terms of the discussion about indigenous identity and politics whether that be the anointing of the paramount fictional guide to the indigenous landscapes or what recon reconciliation is or isn't, I think the non-native grip is loosening and I think, it, I think it's a thing to celebrate. The question then though is, is who should non-native non -native people listen to? You know, where do we take our, our, our leadership from? Um, and I think it's an incumbent for non-native people to develop our own political orientation, 
to self-educate, um, so that we actually know how to make, make these judgments. Um, I think it's really important for us to be able to, to, to become louder um, about the reconciliation industry um, and, and be clear when our government falls very short of the most basic standards. Um, the, the danger otherwise is, as I think Art often worried about, that, that we would be taken in by these kind of moves of the, of the Trudeau government, including um, appointing the first Indigenous Justice Minister. Um, Art was always very, very critical of um, mainstream Aboriginal leadership. Um, he thought that they could serve, at best, uh, a policy purpose. Um, I remember once he said, they write, they write good letters. Um, and that was one of his more charitable moments. Um, and Art had kind of traced the process whereby the national organizations had started accepting federal funding in the 1970s and had steadily compromised their political independence, um, becoming kind of structurally dependent arms of the federal government. Um, and I think we saw that, we saw the results of that during Idle No More, um, when a rising movement kind of had its wings clipped um, by the actions of the AFN, you know, who agreed to meet Harper. Um, and the AFN at that time came in for really strong criticism, and we, we saw their legitimacy um, kind of go into crisis. Um, and there was a desperate scramble among all the political parties, including the NDP and the corporate media, to try to reconsolidate their legitimacy and their reputation. Um, Art always put his faith in, in grassroots activism, um, and he, he, he often talked about how there should be an audit of, which I think could be extended not just to Native organizations, but and, and within the NGO industrial complex across this country, um, an audit to, to actually evaluate if the money that they were getting from federal and provincial sources was still worth it. Um, ultimately, though, I think it's, it's bigger than the AFN, it's bigger than Trudeau, it's bigger than, than, than liberals. Um, it's really about our, our world view. Um, it's about the kind of domi dominant economic mindset um, of our time, which sees everything as a commodity to be exploited and extracted. Starting, of course, with human beings, workers, whose labor is mined at the absolute lowest possible price across the world. Um, and this extractive mindset also includes all natural resources, especially fossil fuels. Um, it includes even the productive economy itself. Um, the Panama Papers only confirmed what so many of us already knew, that the 1% see the whole global economy as a resource from which to extract value and wealth, to stash it away in their own parallel economy where no one else can get at it. Extractivism, a worldview that sees progress as a process of extracting value from all things, this attitude has also played a historic role in the theft of indigenous territory and the destruction of indigenous livelihoods and lifeways. It can be seen in brutal forms, extracting, indi extract, extracting indigenous children from their communities, shutting them away in residential schools where their Indianness was to be extracted through force and abuse. But I think it can also be seen in more subtle ways. So I would argue that the Trudeau government's desire to support the UN Declaration without it embracing its core principles is also a form of extractivism. The latest commodity that the government wants to mine from indigenous territories is the commodity of consent itself. And reconciliation too in this way, in the way that, that our current government, government seems to want to do it, is also an extractive process. And I think this, extract, this extractivism goes deep, very deep into the mentality and culture um, of the Canadian elite. And it's really shaped our kind of body politic, um, made many things unsayable, seem undoable, um, in a way that, that sets apart our nation from um, those we imagine to be our peers. Um, we have to remember that a big part of this country was founded because of the purchase um, of the trading enterprise Hudson Bay Company, Rupert's Land. Um, as Naomi Klein says, Canada was an extractive company before it was a country. Um, and even, even the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in a, in a kind of um, a little, a little examined section actually points out the ways in which the treaties themselves, the number of treaties, were designed to clear the way for certain kinds of extraction. Um, so in Treaty 5, for instance, um, the development, it was about the development of a, a commercial fishery on Lake Winnipeg and the expansion of a steamboat network. 
In Treaty 8, the report says it was negotiated to facilitate the exploitation of the Klondike, Klondike Gold Hills, Gold Fields, excuse me. Treaties 9, 10, and the additions to Treaty 5 were responses to the growth of resource industries in Northern Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. And Treaty 11 was prompted by the discovery of crude oil in the Northwest Territories. We still export shocking amounts of raw logs, unprocessed or unrefined oil. And in many of our provinces, natural resources are still the predominant uh, source of exports. So the bottom line is resource extraction is still a central part of Canada's core identity. In, in the kind of flourishing of self-praise that we have been hearing of late for Canada's 150th, much of this has been glossed over or completely ignored. Um, we hear about Canada as a nation of no qualities, as a nation without an ideology, um, as a nation of peace and order. Um, but Canada was a, a very specific kind of project. Um, it was a liberal project. Um, not a liber liberal democracy, um, because it was hardly that for many decades. Um, it was a liberal project designed by a few white men in some southern cities uh, that, that then very quickly swept across a northern continent of diverse languages uh, peoples and cultures. Um, these men created political parties that disagreed about some things, but not about the fundamentals. Um, the peak greatness of British parliamentary government, um, the equality of adults with white skins and penises, um, and the freedom to acquire and defend private property. Um, and these men built a political order to make this liberal vision a reality. Um, you know, this experiment in a way of ruling has always been fought by the left and by indigenous peoples. Um, and it was only under those pressures that many of the things that we value today uh, emerged. Citizenship rights, the vote, trade union security, universal social programs. Um, and the removal and assimilation of indigenous peoples was always an explicitly acknowledged precondition of this liberal order. Um, actually existing liberalism had nothing harmonious about it. Um, you know, it's interesting that a week ago, I don't know if people saw this, but um, there was a storm of outrage uh, when conservative MP Steve Blaney uh, spoke pretty incoherently on, on power, power and politics on CBC's uh, kind of mainstay political show about how indigenous reserves should be dismantled um, and the land should be privatized. But what's interesting is that this goal was one of the opening salvos of Canada's liberal project. And in one form or another, it's continued to this day. Um, the 1851 Gradual Enfranchisement Act um, was designed to do exactly this, to break apart uh, communally held territory. Um, and with the assumption that um, the magic of private property would somehow catapult indigenous peoples from collective thraldom of tribal stupor into the progressive, acquisitive individualism of the emerging Canadian dream. Um, and when was, that, when was that piece of legislation taken off the, t taken off the table? 1985. Um, and privatization schemes in one form or another continue to this day. Unequal treaties, reservations, past laws, all were part of this liberal project. Um, and re residential schools, of course, were in many ways the main laboratory um, of liberalism, intended to individualize and marginalize indigenous peoples. Um, and what's interesting is that as the kind of ruling ideology of, of this country has shifted from liberalism to neoliberalism, um, indigenous peoples have again been at the kind of brunt end of that. Um, we saw kind of the offloading of programs and services onto indigenous communities in the 1980s and 1990s without the adequate funding um, for these communities to actually run their own programs and services. And what you saw then is a kind of structural adjustment program that was imposed on communities, um, whereby communities were often put into third party management, trusteeship. Um, the funding you know, that comes from the general social envelope and has been under assault by Tory governments, by liberal governments. Um, indigenous peoples were the first to have their funding cut always, so that you know, the 2% cap on funding emerges at this time. Um, and the unshackling of corporations and their heightened power um, unleashed on the lands of indigenous peoples was also a function of this kind of neo neoliberal shift. Um, what's interesting is that, the, the, that this liberal project has never, never fully succeeded, um, thanks to indigenous resistance. Um, 
it's never been able to alter the kind of constitutional regime that exists in this country. Um, the Royal Proclamation, of course, is at the, the, you know, the heart of why Indigenous peoples maintain title in this province. Um, and this kind of framework is what Art often talked about as, as creating, creating um, the possibility for a real transformation on the ground. Um, he talked about the, the constitutional prote protection that Indigenous peoples have in Section 35, um, the international standards through the UN Declaration, um, and the Supreme Court precedents. Um, he thought that this was a framework for uh, a powerful transformation of Canada, a, re a basis for real, real reconciliation. Um, and, um, you know, it, a great but still unfinished task of, of liberation in this country. Um, and I think the good news is that, that we're actually more ready than ever to, to, to finish that project, um, the project of liberation. Um, for so long, non-Native people, I think, have been taught to see the rights of Indigenous peoples as a threat um, to their interests. Um, you know, you dare to restore sovereignty or rights to Indigenous peoples, the story goes, and you know, Canadians will be hustled out of their jobs, off the land, you know, or, or in the most absurd way, back on the boat to, to Europe. Um, but I think social movements change social consciousness. Um, and I don't know more, while it, it, didn't, it didn't change the, the basic kind of political institutions in this country, I think it left a deep, a really deep cultural imprint. Um, and I think started the beginnings of a really remarkable social transformation. Um, you know, and that, that groundwork was laid before Idle No More. It was laid by indigenous communities who have been um, often isolated in rural areas, who have been resisting uh, industrial developments. Um, it was, uh, that groundwork was laid by a lot of the educational, uh, educational work that was done by defenders of the land through Indigenous Sovereignty Week educationals in scores of communities across this country. Um, I think it was also definitely done by the families impacted by murdered and missing indigenous women. Um, multi-decade struggle um, to try to transform people's understanding. Um, and I think Canadians are actually starting to, 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 to believe in a new story, um, a story that allying with indigenous peoples who have legal rights you know, and a fierce attachment to the lands and waters may in fact um, offer the surest chance of protecting our collective climate and environment. Um, you know, I look at how social media has connected and amplify, amplified all these new indigenous voices, um, the new urban and rural networks that are emerging. Um, and I, I think we're starting to reach a kind of cultural tipping point um, among non-native people. I think back to um, when my, I'm sure other people experienced this as well, when, when our Facebook was awash with people kind of checking in to, uh, to Standing Rock as a kind of gesture of solidarity with the, the water protectors there protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and I love what I, th I mean, it was 1.5 million people, right? Uh, is that something that was imaginable like five or 10 years ago? I don't, I don't think so. Um, and I really love what I think this says about the, the new connections that are being made between indigenous rights, water protection, climate change and capitalism, racial and gender justice, um, about how the, the stories that that people are telling about who our heroes are is changing. Um, and so too, therefore, the, the horizon of action. Um, yeah, I mean, I think about the standing rocks of recent history in Canada. Uh, Oka, Gustafson, Tomogamy, Burnt Church, Sun Peak, Six Nations, Barrier Lake, Elspuktuk, where there never seemed enough non-Indigenous people who saw their liberation tied up with the liberation of Indigenous peoples. And I wonder if the eagerness of non-Indigenous people to travel to a blockade on social media um, will translate to their joining one eventually uh, on highways, at logging roads, in the paths of dams and mines and pipelines across this country. Um, I think it might. Um, that, if it were the case, would bring us much closer to the vision that Art had um, of seizing the untapped potential of a new and strengthened alliance between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. Art knew that reconciliation was a very powerful hope, uh, a deeply desired new relationship that Trudeau and the liberal government had very skillfully harnessed and manipulated. But if reconciliation does not include the restitution of land, the recognition of real self-government, 
the reining in of abusive police, the remediation of rivers and forests, the revitalization of languages, it will remain a vacant notion, a cynical ploy to preserve a status quo in need not of tinkering, but transformation. It will amount to nothing more than a cheap simulation of justice. For, for reconciliation to take on that full sense, I think non-Native people um, need, to, need to start listening much more closely. Um, I think of what Lee Miracle once said, the lessons we need to learn from each other are already there. They've been there for decades. What does Canada know about us? And I think there's such an incredible uh, flourishing of people and campaigns uh, and movements in this country that we can turn to and listen. Um, I don't know if people saw the, the Grammys last week, but I got goosebumps listening to the Northern Cree drummers. Um, who brought their round dance music to an international audience. Um, I think of Tribe Called Red and Tanya Tagag, or reading the words of Leanne Simpson, Tracy Lindbergh, Charles, Wagama Charles Wagamizi, or being moved by the astonishing art of Christy Belcour, um, or the gentle ribbings administered in the art of Kent Monkman, um, laughing at the comedy of Ryan McMahon, or reading the journalism of the Red Wire magazine the analysis of Russ Dybo or Pam Palmiter or Hayden King or Erica Violet Lee or the legal teachings of Sylvia McAdam. I think of a new generation of young indigenous activists and leaders who are really taking this country in a different direction. Um, and if people haven't seen it, the, on, on Twitter, resistance, resistance150, the hashtag, um, where every day a different indigenous artist, thinker, activist has been tweeting their perspectives on this 150th uh, anniversary of Canada. Um, I want to leave you with a closing thought from Arthur, from Arthur Emanuel, uh, from his book, uh, Unsettling Canada, um, which, is, which I think no serious kind of student of Canadian history and Indigenous history in this country can ignore. Art says, there is room on this land for all of us, and there must also be, after centuries of struggle, room for justice for Indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Now it's working. Uh, thank you again for your words tonight. And uh, maybe just give another round of applause for us. I, I, I really honestly don't have too much to add. And I'm, 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 I don't have any pertinent questions coming to my mind, but I might eventually as I hear some more. Um, so I do want to open it up for questions. Um, but I'm going to ask for some ground rules tonight. Um, when we do these questions. One is I'd like to ask for some equity between who's, who's getting asked or who's getting a chance to ask the questions. How about a really aggressive equity program? Yeah. 300 years of questions from women and then we'll take a few from men. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but uh, I, I just want people to be conscious about who's asking the questions. Um, and also, I am gonna be very strict with you right now and I'm telling you this around asking questions. So if you have a statement, I am gonna cut you off. Okay, I wanna hear some questions. So uh, I believe that uh, our movement needs to be a little bit more on top of this sometimes. And the only way to do that is to practice that commitment. So uh, I, I do wanna open up for questions. Is there, just by show of hands, how many people have questions? Okay, cool, there's a few. Um, so maybe we'll start. I just wondered if you had thought about um, the divisions that aren't so clear. Um, all First Nations people or all Aboriginal people aren't on one side and the rest of Canadians on the other side. And we've seen that recently um, when there was proposed reconciliation legislation in British Columbia. It was actually the provincial government and the First Nations Leadership Council together tried to hoist that through a vote of all the chiefs in British Columbia. Now, none of them supported it, but 
it seems like with every initiative, there is um, many First Nations people that are on the side of the government that support, and we're going to see it again, because they're going to propose Canadian legislation on reconciliation. We don't know what that looks like. But they will try to garner the support of the Assembly of First Nations and others. So I, I just wondered if you'd ever put any thought into that. Good question. Um, the question is, uh, what does this look like in 20 years uh, when we make a choice one way or another way about what reconciliation might even look like? Consequences go either way and for, for whatever we choose. So what does it look like in 20 years? And my closest analogy is I was in, spent three years working with Haiti when the government and the, through the, um, the earthquake and the complexities of how government and, uh, in this case, the American Clinton Foundation, for the Haitian people is very similar to what's happening in Canada on so many levels. So my, that's my question is, what does it potentially look like in 20 years from today? A real easy one. <laughs> <laughs> you good, Daddy? Uh, oh, that's good. <laughs> Especially, I think the last question last. Um, some, some of your, some of the, the terms went over my head. Uh, um, reparative, reparative capitalism. Yeah, it's, it's sort of an idea that I am playing with. It's not one that I've seen debated out there a lot, but it sort of puts reconciliation in the context of the Canadian context. Like, what does that mean? Right. Um, I mean, what, what's interesting is that I think, like, um, so often in the reconciliation industry's discourse, um, just to take it a slightly different way, the, the repair is always focused on uh, the bodies uh, and, and, uh, and spirits of indigenous peoples, right? It's, 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 it's so rarely or never about repairing the colonial relationship, right? Um, and there's this kind of like sleight of hand that happens uh, in which um, the responsibility and onus is put on indigenous peoples when it's not. Like it, it should be on uh, non-native Canada to transform that relationship and decolonize it, right? Um, and you also talked about um, the kind of economic interests um, uh, underlying some some of this stuff, um, like the political the political economy of of, of dispossession. Um, yeah, I mean we're talking about. I mean as Art was was documenting, like we are talking about billions and billions of dollars uh, that are uh, at stake. Um, and when, you know, when when, I mean just in the fossil fuel industry alone, right? Who's um, Who's, so many of their, the new gas wells, the new the new kind of frontier is on on indigenous territory. Um, like they they're starting to get more and more scared, right? Like indigenous rights terrify the fossil fuel industry more than anything else. Um, but the thing is, is that when when there's a small group of people um, who have so much to lose financially, the only way we can beat that is if we build a massive movement. Uh, of people with a lot to gain, right? Um, and I think it is, uh, it's exciting. I mean, the, the only, the, we have the power of numbers and spirit and against the, the, the power of, of money. Um, and I think that um, that's why it's been so exciting to see. I mean, in this province, probably more than anywhere else, um, of more and more non-native people uh, getting behind uh, indigenous rights and struggles. Um, and I think uh, in many ways um, that shows us the path forward. Like in, 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 tw in 20 years time, I mean, I, mean I, I think even in a few years time, like I, arts, arts, art often talked about um, how the only way that we could actually get, uh, we could actually get the federal government to implement these rights on the ground um, was if we, if we built a, a social movement on the scale of the civil rights movement in, in the states, right? Um, 
where you had hundreds of non-native people um, joining, uh, uh, I mean, not, sorry, in that case, white, white people joining black people in the South um, and getting arrested alongside them. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I could see land defense camps like cropping up across this country, you know? Certainly uh, when it comes to, when Kinder Morgan tries to build uh, tries to put the shovel into the ground. Um, but why not uh, places across this country uh, where mining projects, clear-cut logging, uh, and massive hydro-industrial dams are being built? Um, uh, in a way also that points to the alternatives that are, as we know, as cheap or cheaper now than dirty fossil fuel um, forms of energy. Um, why not? Uh, in, 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 in the pathway of those pipelines and those mines, uh, put up the solar panels and the windmills that are the energy, you know, to power the future. Um, I think that, um, I think, I think that's, I think we, I think we're, I think we're at the point where, where, where non-native people are, a lot of non-native people are ready to have their energy channeled in that direction. Um, and I don't think we were there five or, five or ten years ago. Um, and as, as to your question, like it's interesting, art, yeah, I mean, art was at the center of that, that struggle as well for the, against the BC Recognition, Recognition and Reconciliation Act, which was actually one of the first times that uh, any government in this country tried to um, kind of, as art would say, polish a turd uh, by giving it a different name. Like a turd is still a turd even if you polish it, if you give it that kind of language. Um, and it's a, it's a hard question, but no doubt, like tactics of divide and and, and rule and of using the um, the AFN and other other organizations as a rubber stamp for their policies is going to continue. You know, um, and uh, it's I mean, it sounds like I think it sounds like you have a lot of the the, the answers, right? In terms of it's, it has to it has to be a matter of organizing. Like I remember when that when that happened, uh, art printed. Uh, a newspaper with Carrie, um, Carrie Coast, um, printed 10, 15,000 copies just to educate people what, about what that Reconciliation and Recognition Act was about, which was about cementing uh, these policies that they had otherwise not been able to get the consent from indigenous communities for. Um, and he was able to, and many other organizers were able to beat back that legislation. So I think initially the UBC Indian chiefs also, not just the uh, not just the First Nations um, um, summit, excuse me, yeah, the summit were, had supported, right? So um, it's, I mean, it, it, and it's going to happen this summer at, at some point. Um, this is the, the, the kind of next national reconciliation legislation that the government will be unveiling. It's no doubt, there's no doubt that they, they will have chiefs lined up to support it. Um, and I think a lot of other people could be overwhelmed by that. And certainly the public will think, oh, wow, you know, this is a real, a real, um, a real break. It's a real kind of fundamental break. Um, and um, so I think it's up to the public and up to people like yourself just to get, get the word out there and educate people otherwise. I just I mentioned, too, uh, something that's really interesting about the, the, that uh, legislation that was proposed in BC is that one of the architects of that process is now the justice minister um, who was deeply involved with that and um, has a litigious background um, and in the few speeches that she's given has talked about um, you know it's going back and forth there's a spectrum it goes from like using uttering the words decolonizing Canada to um, we're going to create a Canadian version of, of free, prior, and informed consent. Um, but the tactic that governments have become successful at trying to do the divide and conquer thing is opt-in legislation, which is the case that they didn't do there. It was trying to have a, a blanket, we're going to have a one box fits all, and everybody has to come on board, and if you don't come on board, then that's it. And I remember talking actually to uh, an elected chief at the time, um, 
who was from the Okanagan, and, and part of it was, he was saying like, you know, the Okanagan communities, as far as he was concerned, um, were okay with the legislation because they already had their kind of political leadership structure figured out. But then when he tried to implement this province-wide legislation that would collapse essentially around 170 different negotiation tables into 11 tables, um, you had historical grievances between indigenous community, within indigenous communities or indigenous nations having to sort it out. For example, uh, a, a community like Arts Nation, where you have the communities that are pro-treaty, the ones that aren't, and the ones that are doing their own thing, and all of a sudden they would have all had to sit at the same table and be one uh, negotiation table when there's huge uh, differences of opinion about what to negotiate for and how to negotiate. Um, and it's the same thing for the Stalo. You know, the Stalo have th the Stalo Nation and the Stalo Tribal Council and the communities that are, un are unaffiliated with those two communities. So like, there's these historical grievances um, in, in political alliances, and what I suspect that the federal government will come in and try to do is offer an opt-in legislation, which is what they've done previously, in order to get some First Nations to come on board, which is the BC Treaty process, which then allows the government to say, we're succeeding at whatever their goals are by hoisting up uh, their select representatives of the broader community. So it's scary. It's like It's really scary the way that um, th they can manipulate things um, to the detriment of all of us. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for your um, extremely stimulating, engaging talk. Uh, I just want to pick up um, some of the things that you were just saying there about a, a kind of uh, um, resistance to this new Canadian version um, uh, of uh, essentially the, the UN drip. Um, and I, I'm wondering if this doesn't open a kind of terrain for, for kind of, you know, in a sense, rhetorical struggle insofar as um, there's something about Canada which, which uh, um, orients it, I think, to uh, really investing a lot and believing a lot in its own myths. And one of those myths is that it's a, a model global citizen. And that, one of the, the implications of that um, is that the country pays a, a lot of heed to precisely these kinds of UN declarations. Right. Um, yet we have a government, uh, we have the Justice Minister who uh, on April 16th, 2016 said um, essentially the, the uh, ad adaptation into Canadian law uh, of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples w w would be unworkable right? and hence the need for, for this uh, legislation. Uh, I'm wondering what the moral force of precisely that idea of uh, free, uh, prior, and informed consent is, rather than some, you know, watered-down version. Can that be used, in a sense, to hold the government um, uh, accountable and to build, um, you know, a degree of, 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 of opposition uh, to it? Um, so... Should we take any, if there's any more? Yeah, is there any more? And I'm particularly thinking that we've gotten a few guys already, so. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. My colleague and I were wondering if you had any thoughts on some of the more recent work that's being done to revitalize indigenous legal traditions, particularly around environmental protection. Then I'm going to throw to you, <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so as we're speaking, uh, the city of Vancouver is um, discussing and planning to uh, tear down the Dunsmuir and Georgia viaducts. Um, and that's being done in the context of memorializing, uh, memorializing um, Hogan's Alley, which uh, I'm wondering, does, does everyone know about Hogan's Alley? Yeah, so Hogan's Alley was uh, uh, Vancouver's original black community, um, and uh, the black community was displaced because the city was planning to uh, put a freeway through it. 
Um, the freeway was not uh, put in, but uh, the viaducts did go up, and by that time, the community had already been displaced. Um, <clears throat> so what's happening right now, though, is that the city is saying uh, it uh, made a huge error, you know, it uh, displaced the black community. This was uh, a racist measure, you know, because there is a history of, in North American cities, of it's always coincidentally black communities uh, that have freeways put right through them. Uh, and the city is saying to redress this mistake, uh, they are going to tear down the viaducts, right? Now, the thing is, uh, underneath the viaducts uh, is a whole lot of land uh, owned by a number of different developers, Concord Pacific, the Akalinis, uh, and they will build condos uh, and uh, at the very least unaffordable uh, market rental suites. Uh, and this area, that area, which, which is uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the region around it is populated by indigenous people, Chinese people, uh, and what's happening is that they're going to be displaced, right? Because gentrification, uh, rents are going to go up uh, for, the, for the whole region. Um, and what I'm seeing is a, uh, an attempt at reconciliation. Uh, that language isn't exactly used, but there's this whole thing of saying, you know, we're uh, coordinating with and we are trying to do something for the black community, right? They, they say they're going to build perhaps a community center. Maybe there's going to be a... Uh, a plaque or something, I don't know what, uh, on behalf of the black community to uh, memorialize the black community. But they're doing so at the expense of the Chinese and indigenous community. So this is an obvious example of how reconciliation, the language of reconciliation, can actually do a lot more harm and mask uh, further dispossession and further racism. So what I'm wondering are, uh, I want to ask two things. Number one, um, you've talked a lot about what actual reconciliation looks like. I think a lot of people have an idea of what reconciliation looks like in this situation. It means social housing. It means uh, ending gentrification, right? Uh, the question is, how do we actually stop it, right? People are so disempowered that they're saying, you know what, I'll take the plaque. I got nothing else. I'm, we're not going to beat the city and we're not going to beat the developers, you know, who are giving uh, Vision Vancouver millions of dollars, right? Uh, so how do we beat it, number one, um, and how do we connect uh, the um, forms of resistance that you're talking about, indigenous resistance, to these empty forms of uh, misleading forms of reconciliation, connect them with uh, black people who are displaced, Chinese people who are displaced, with gentrification, with whatever else, whatever other movements there are. Thanks for those questions. Do you want to handle the question about indigenous law? Yeah. Yeah. So, how many people are just out of curiosity? How many people are familiar with the concept of like ever? Actually, I, I use this with my students. How many of you have heard the term indigenous law before? By show of hands. Okay. Um, how many people think indigenous law and Aboriginal law are the same thing? Okay. Good. Um, you guys are right. <laughs> they are not the same thing. Um, so there's, there's an interesting thing that's happening within the field of indigenous law, and there's a lot of cool scholars that are really coming up and really exploring this, uh, and particularly ex uh, uh, trying to reclaim our, our uh, existence as peoples and as nations as more than just uh, cultures and societies, but that we actually have and maintain, uh, maintain a practice of legal traditions, but not legal in the sense of a Western, a Western colonial sense of legal, but in the sense of uh, we have our own traditions of maintaining um, all the things that law tends to maintain within a community, but in a different way. Now, I'm familiar with it within the context of my cultures and my communities of the Kwakwakiwak and the Coast Salish or Squamish. Um, but one of the interesting things about indigenous law and the arguments that I make about um, the reason why indigenous languages are vital to the thriving of indigenous legal practices 
And this is the invitation that I ask people to think about. Imagine if a, there was a world in which um, all, the language all the English language speakers disappeared throughout the world, and there was no more English language speakers. And then add, you know, 300 years. And then people were to come and look at Supreme Court decisions and try and interpret the context in which these decisions were made and the impacts that these decisions had on, the pe on people's lives. So you take something like the assisted dying legislation, the Supreme Court decision that happened uh, last year around that. And imagine if you don't speak English and there are no English speakers around and you had to try and interpret this legal decision that had this impact on law and on society and things like that. But imagine trying to do that without any fluent speakers or any speakers of the language that are alive or around it, and they hadn't been around for a few hundred years. So any interpretation of indigenous law, in my mind at least, absolutely requires the use of the language in which these legal traditions were created. To interpret it otherwise is to interpret, I mean, um, translation is always uh, a problem um, when it comes to this kind of stuff because you're trying to, in essence, get to the root uh, meaning and value, um, but if you're doing it through another language, you lose so much from it. Uh, and so I think that when it comes to revitalizing indigenous ways of life and indigenous ways of being, uh, when it comes to the indigenous law, I think language is going to be a vital part, part of that. Um, but specifically, and I, this is the thing that I challenge people to think about, that indigenous languages, and, or the movement for indigenous languages isn't about protection. Um, it's about defense. Um, we, the reason I say that is our languages don't need to be protected, they need to be defended because they're being attacked. Uh, we're being inundated with a dominant language that is pushing down and suppressing our indigenous languages and depending on context, they've either been extremely successful or they are still constantly pushing down on, on our indigenous languages and so the work to push back on that is actually about defending it's about not just trying to put up a shield, but actually trying to resist and repel the forces that are attacking our indigenous languages. Um, and so I, I, I encourage people to think about it that way as opposed to uh, dying languages or saving languages, but they actually need defending. They need people to step up and defend them um, and people to support the people that are defending them, so. Yeah. Um, Samir, first to your question. Yeah, I think that I think that Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government are their weak spot is when it comes to um, the gulf between reality and rhetoric. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, Canada. People think Canada is a beacon. It's not, but it can be, right? Um, certainly, the prospects for social transformation in this country are much greater than they are south of the border, um, and, um, and I, think, I think that the, that, that FPIC, that free prior informed consent, is this um, really crystallizing uh, political demand um, that I think really cuts to the core of uh, what this country is and, and, and uh, isn't, but what it could be. Like I think um, if you, I mean, we're, t we're talking about huge swaths of territory uh, that the Crown claims, um, that Indigenous peoples live on, um, that are uh, currently, in the way they're being managed and run, turning Canada into an absolute cr climate criminal. And I think if, if the question were posed to Canadians, um, do you want these huge tracts of land uh, controlled by and run and managed by multinational corporations whose interest in them doesn't extend beyond the financial quarter? Or do you want them stewarded by indigenous communities uh, whose stewardship of these lands is multi-generational? Um, what do you think Canadians uh, will say? I think that they will increasingly um, pick the right answer. And I think that could transform this country. Um, and as to, to your question, um, excuse me. Um, I mean, especially when it comes to indigenous communities, but many, many impoverished communities, I mean, they're often stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? Like the, the, the choices between extract, extractivist projects or poverty, right? Um, and I think, uh, I think it's incumbent upon 
uh, us to, to, to ensure that those are not the choices that people uh, have to face, right? Uh, and we change that politically. Um, and I also think, like you were saying, we're, we're facing too many crises, uh, crises of racism, of inequality, of climate change, uh, too many crises to fight them kind of one by one, right? Um, in an isolated way. Um, there's, there, we cannot find uh, liberation in isolation. Um, and I think we need to, as, as some of us tried to do uh, with the LEAP Manifesto, um, was to try to propose solutions uh, that simultaneously tackle these crises and address these crises. And I think people are hungry for that kind of s systemic answer and analysis. Um, like what we were focusing primarily on, on the threat that climate change poses, but we said that in, you know, climate change doesn't have to have technocratic solutions. Um, in fact, those aren't, those aren't working, right? If we can show that addressing climate change can make this country fundamentally more humane and just across the board, then people will go for it, right? Like um, creating thousands and thousands of good new jobs, um, uh, designing policies so that they uh, reduce inequalities um, and tackle head-on racism and sexism um, that honor indigenous rights um, and really heal the, the wounds at the heart of this country's founding. Um, I think we can, we, we, we don't, we, we, it's not that we can, we have to. Like we don't have a, I don't think we have a choice in the times that we live in, um, but to uh, connect the dots um, and try to fight for these things in a simultaneous and systemic kind of way. Uh, so I just was saying that I want to thank everybody for being here tonight, and um, I, I leave you with a share share with you uh, a concept that comes from my culture, which is that um, you know when we gather like this, uh, th that your response to the invitation shows that you are you know making an honoring that it's this is the way that you show uh, manners in, in our culture because um, when we would host gatherings and what we call call people together. Um, it, it's uh, the, the, responding to the invitation is the way that you show uh, that you honor the host um, by showing up. And it was considered a, a, a huge ge uh, gesture of respect uh, and, and, and would be re reciprocated with um, you know, gratitude and respect towards the people that came. So you know, I think about tonight and I think about this work and this conversation and I think about all of you for making the choice to be here. Um, and to engage with this and to want to learn more. You know, I heard, I heard a story, I heard a, 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 from a person who actually works in the reconciliation industry, and I call it that because they actually do work for, or they did actually, they don't anymore. Um, but they, they told me about a, an internal poll that they, did, they paid lots of money to do a national survey on reconciliation. And this is, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, but they were quite struck by some of the data that they found from it. So one of the things that they found was that, um, if I remember the numbers correctly, six out of 10 Canadians um, supported the idea of reconciliation, um, which is basically around the amount of people that don't vote for the Conservatives, um, approximately. Um, but they also said that uh, four out of five of the people that want reconciliation didn't know what it meant. And that three out of five of those people said that they wanted to be told what reconciliation was by indigenous people. I mean, this all, this all kind of makes sense, right? It's like, I want it. I don't know what it is, and I want to be told what to do. Uh, and so that was actually really instructive for me to think about reconciliation. And part of the, honestly, part of the reason why I'm so curious about it. Because when, when people say, like, I want it, and I don't know what it is, and I want to be told what to do, um, then it's a great opportunity for indigenous people to step up and say, do this. <laughs> Um, and I think that that's, that's part of what we're, we're trying to investigate and trying to explore and also be doing it, you know, eyes wide open, um, being aware of the power structures that are still present and still going to be uh, trying to dominate and keep their power structures the way that they are. So I just want to thank you all um, for being here. And again, thank Martin for, for, for the talk and for the opportunity. And I just want to give another round of applause for the organizers as well as tonight's speaker.
Um, I would also just like to say a couple of words of thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Martin, for coming. Uh, wonderful talk, um, very rich and engaging. Uh, and uh, Salem, thank you so much um, for your um, invaluable contributions as well. Um, I'd also like to thank, um, and this is all on behalf, uh, not just of the Institute, but um, also our, our partners. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for coming uh, this evening. And, and I hope to see you uh, out at uh, some future events.